Greetings everybody and welcome back. Well, it seems like just a couple of weeks ago I put the Seahawk in the water for the season and took her under the bridge heading for the Yacht Club and getting ready for a nice season of sail. Although it wasn't the greatest season, usually seemed to be either way too much wind or none at all, I did get some really pretty sails in, including some really nice evening sails. Another special highlight that I always enjoy is out watching the 4th of July fireworks with my wife and youngest daughter. That's always a lot of fun. My youngest daughter is not quite the sailing enthusiast that I am, but I'm always grateful whenever she comes out with me and we always have a nice time. Another highlight was traveling to Chicago and getting to hang out at the Columbia Yacht Club. There I got to visit with my daughter who was in town representing the Coast Guard Academy for a big race out on the lake. The folks there at the Columbia Yacht Club treated us like royalty. And it was great to see my daughter and her crew out representing the Coast Guard Academy. Although they predicted heavy weather and even canceling the races, the wind really couldn't have been better. They had their ups and downs in the race, but all in all it was a good show, they put up a good fight, and had a great time. I really couldn't be prouder of my two amazing daughters. Back home as the summer and autumn wound down, I got in as many sales as I could. I even got a really nice one, one of the best of the season, in early November. But alas, it was time to drop the mast again, take her under the bridge the other way, and start to get her ready for the winter. There are a few projects and upgrades I'm going to do to it this winter, which I'll cover. Now normally my projects are shown as I do them, but one I made at the beginning of the season, I wanted to wait until the season was over to show you how it stood up. At the very end of the season in 2019, my tiller broke just as I was pulling out of the dock. As I was backing out of the dock, I threw the helm over and it cracked right there at the bracket for the rudder. That was definitely an oh <laughs> moment. There's absolutely nothing like that feeling of your boat not answering her helm, especially when you need it the most. Now, even though it was a laminated tiller, it failed because there was way too much drilled through it, too many adjoining bolt holes, and too much water ingress in there. And although I changed it over to stainless steel, one of the previous owners was using ferrous base fasteners in there, which didn't do any favors to the wood. Now, luckily, I had a backup tiller, which allowed me to get through the rest of that season, but it wasn't really fitting very well into the rudder bracket. It kind of squeaked a lot, it needed a lot of shimming, and I didn't like the idea of having just one tiller. I think it's always a good idea to have a backup. So it's time to make another one. Now this winter I'm going to make a laminated tiller, but in this case, just to get me back out on the water and safe, I was gonna make one out of solid wood. Start off just simple enough by tracing the old tiller out, but I am going to add some extra material under this area of the tiller right here. That's going to be used for some sort of integrated tiller tamer. Something to hold it in place while I'm raising the sails and sailing solo. But I want to recreate the basic outline of the old tiller since it works so well. I'm also going to leave a lot more material in the back where the tiller fits into the rudder fitting. That way I won't have to shim it as much, if at all, and it should be a lot more efficient fit. Now since this tiller isn't going to have a lot of direct contact with the water, I feel a lot more comfortable making it out of red oak. It's also what I happen to be able to get a hold of in this thickness. But boy, even with a relatively new band on my bandsaw, I had a heck of a time getting through this stuff. This is all sped up for time, but it took an enormous amount of time to get through all this material. This little area right here is what I was talking about for adding some sort of an integrated tiller tamer. Keeping in mind, this is only roughing it out. I'm going way outside of the lines for this one, and I'll use other tools to really tune this up and get it close. Now the next step is to start to build the taper in the tiller, especially along the sides. I'm going to start out in the front using an electric planer, taking off little bits near the front, and then each time moving along a little longer to start that taper. It creates a really nice, smooth, and even taper. Again, this is still pretty well roughing it out, so I pause every few passes, check it out of how it looks along the center line, and repeat the same thing on the other side. Thank you. 
Now while the width at the back is pretty well set to the rudder brackets, I am going to trim the top and the bottom a little bit. What I don't show you here is that pretty much after every couple of passes, I take it back outside and fit it into the rudder to make sure it's fitting well. The reason I'm not showing that is because it was pouring down rain outside and I didn't want to get my camera wet. Next I start getting it down to a finished shape by using an oscillating belt sander. As I've mentioned before, these oscillating belt and drum sanders are really indispensable tools for woodworking. And it's able to give you a lot more shape and control than just about anything I've ever found. Especially pieces like this that have compound and complex shapes. Like all of these curves along with a taper, which you can see here. Next I use a roundover bit in my router table to help refine the handle a little bit, as well as put a nice radius on the rest of the tiller, except for the very back where it's going to fit into the rudder bracket. I am going to take a little bit off on the corners on that area where it fits into the rudder bracket, but nowhere near as much as this roundover bit will do. I'll just take those edges off the tiller on the back with a small woodblock plane. Now I know it looks like my fingers are close to the bit, but they're not. The camera angle just makes it kind of look like it is. I have absolutely no desire for a router bit manicure. After that I'm going to drill a small hole through the tiller, right where I put that extra material for some sort of a homemade tiller tamer. I wanted it to be integrated with the tiller rather than something I tack on afterwards. After that I put three coats of Halcyon on it. I used the amber version of this. It's one of my favorite products that Total Boat makes. It goes on really easily. There's no need to sand between coats. It cleans up with water and it's tough as iron. A lot of times these amber tinted finishes don't particularly look like amber to me. But especially with this red oak, it came out looking really spectacular. Now one of the reasons I held off on showing you how this was made is that I wanted to show you how it stood up against wear and weather, which includes rain and UV exposure. So at the end of a season with a heck of a lot of use, I took it off and examined it and I'm really pleased with it. There's just a couple little areas I'm going to have to touch up in the spring. Back here where the tiller fits into the rudder bracket, there's a small area where the stainless steel dug into the tiller a little bit. Not a big deal. And up here there's a place where when I had to throw the rudder over kind of hard sometimes it would run into a small piece of untreated fiberglass which scuffed it up. So I can fix that and also I'm going to fix the area that caused the problem in the first place so it doesn't scrape up against it like that. Now while we're on the topic of woodworking, I mentioned that I'm helping my nephew work on his 1960s thistle. It's got some major problems with crazing on the hull from a failed gel coat, but we'll cover that in another episode by putting a barrier coat on it. But it's also got some problems with this rub rail. The cap rail appears to be a piece of laminated mahogany plywood with two pieces of oak on either side as a rub rail. There's a small portion on the port side that's rotted away and it's going to need to be replaced. So I'm going to scarf a new piece into that. I didn't even need to saw or cut away this piece. It just crumbled in my hand, but I do want to take it back to clean wood. You'll see me using a lot of Japanese tools in this section. I like them for a lot of different reasons. These Japanese razor saws are pretty amazing. They're able to do extremely fine and precise cuts. And that's just what I need to do here. Now that I've got it back to some healthy wood, I'm going to begin to cut the scarf angle in it. Now in this case I'm going to cut it forward like this, because I think considering the bend that I'm going to have to put the wood in, it's going to fit in there and fit in there tighter a little bit better. But I'm not going to leave the rub rail completely salient like that. I'm going to square the joint off a little bit by just taking a little bit off of that point. I'll explain why here in a couple minutes. I'll use the razor saw to take that edge off. And then clean it up with a nice chisel. 
which is also Japanese, by the way. Now I'm going to clamp the piece of wood that I'm going to use right underneath it and trace it out with a pencil so that I can get the most accurate profile of that joint as I can. Keep in mind too that I have that piece of wood clamped behind me where you can't see it so that I have the curve of the hull taken into consideration too for that joint. Took that piece back into my shop, cut it out, now let's see how it fits. Hey, pretty much right on the money for the first try. Yeah, right. That took me about a half an hour to actually shape that thing in there. Lots of fine work with chisels and sandpaper. But through the magic of editing, I make it look like it was just the first try. Now here's why I took that point off of this joint. On an area like this that's got some stress on the wood because of a curve, as well as an area that's just going to get a lot of action, if that joint ran straight out there like it does along the end of the line that my saw creates, it's going to create a point where a lot of things can snag onto it. Just a little bit of damage and that's going to flake out and start to splinter and it'd be very easy for a piece of line or even the edge of a dock to hit it and just grab that entire thing and rip it right out. It's a lot more secure to have that flat area right there, but the scarf angle makes it a lot tighter joint. Next is to redrill some holes for the stainless steel screws. And here's where I made a couple of mistakes, but we'll get to that. In some cases I'm using where the old screw holes were. In other cases where I don't think they would hold very well, I'm creating new ones into the hull. After that I'm going to put some countersinks in there so I can cover up the screw holes with some bungs. Even with a brand new countersink bit, it still ends up smoking that oak. And I just realized that that hole that I cut in there for the screw is sitting a little bit too high. There needs to be a radius cut into this. And there's a good chance cutting that radius into it is going to run into the screw that's in there. I might be able to make it, but maybe not. So I'm going to drill another screw hole just down from it a little bit and a little bit lower. And I'll have to fill that other screw hole in, which won't be a big problem, but oops. With everything dry fitted, I'm going to add some blue painter's tape so I don't get any glue on the hull. Like I said, I'll cover it in a future episode, but I had just put a new epoxy barrier coat on this and wanted to keep as clean as possible. After soaking the new piece, it's going to be scarfed in in water and wetting down the other surfaces. I'm going to be using my old standby, some polyurethane glue, which cures in the presence of water. Clamp it up nice and tight. And of course my battery on the camera died just as I was putting the stainless steel screws back in, but they are in there. Give some time for the glue to kick. And while it's doing that, I'm going to head back into the shop to make a couple things I need to finish this up. I'm going to use one of these bung or plug cutters, and you can get these just about anywhere. Mount it on a drill press, and using a scrap piece of wood I used to originally make the tiller, I can make some plugs that'll fit perfectly into those countersink holes. There's a lot of different ways to get these out of there, but for this particular purpose, I'm just going to use a screwdriver to pop them out of there. Soak them in water for a little bit. Put some polyurethane glue in there. Tap them in. Fill in my mistake holes a little bit with some more glue. Let that cure overnight. Come back the next day with my Japanese razor saw and take the excess off the bungs. And give it a little light sanding. Now additionally there is a radius that needs to be taken off of the edge of this rub rail to match the profile of the old one. I could probably use a round over bit on a router, but it's a little bit more delicate than that, so I want to use another favorite Japanese tool, a Japanese wood plane. Now the blade is mounted in such a way that I can make a very fine cut on one side of the blade, or move it up a little bit and take up a lot more material. 
One of the things about a Japanese wood plane versus a Western plane is that you pull it instead of push it. It gives you a lot more feedback and a lot more control to make finer cuts. With a little bit of practice and taking your time, these Japanese wood planes give you an amazing result. With the traditionally made folded Japanese steel blades, it's like cutting through butter. They leave a silky smooth cut that sometimes you don't even have to sand. But I will give it a little bit of a sanding to take off some of the high spots with the glue and to start to feather it in a little bit to the old joint. And the final result was even better than I expected. The new joint was nice and tight. There weren't any open seams. It should hold up for a long time. After I dusted it off and prepared the wood a little bit, it was time to add a few coats of Halcyon. I put about four coats on there and it really looks fantastic. Now keep in mind, Halcyon is designed for certain kinds of wood, but it's not the kind of solution you want to use for oily woods, like mahogany or teak. There are other products for that, but if you're making something out of oak or ash or hickory or something like that, Halcyon is really a fantastic solution. Easy to apply, cleans up with water, great UV protection, and it's really, really tough. I really recommend this stuff. Now below in the show notes, you can find a discount code that'll help you save a few bucks off of your next order from Total Boat. And just for disclosure, I don't make any extra commission off of that. That's just a code for you to save a few bucks on your next order. Now, as the Python boys would say, And now for something completely different. In previous episodes, I've mentioned working with Liberty Launch. It's a veteran service organization in the Chesapeake Bay that helps veterans deal with PTSD through their sailing programs. Well, this fall I was contacted by some amazing people out on the West Coast that do some very similar work. I got the privilege over the last week to be out in San Francisco to help out an organization called Wooden Boats for Veterans. I'll be covering in a future episode about the amazing work that they do for vets, a lot through their sailing programs and preserving and restoring wooden boats. And I'm really proud to be working with these folks. I'll include links below to their organization, including their YouTube channel and Facebook page, as well as their website, and I'd highly recommend checking them out. But more details coming up in a future episode. Until then, take care and have a fantastic Thanksgiving. Always remember, keep calm and work on your boat.